today. I can't get enough. It makes me so angry. You obsess about it. I envy anyone getting more than me. It's on my mind all the time. You fantasize about it. I'm obsessed with it. If I had just a little bit more, I know my life would be better. What's holding you back? I'm afraid I'll never have enough. I'm ashamed I don't have more. Find the courage to get what you really want. Well, show me the money. Susie Orman's back, coming up. talking today about something very important, like why some people have more money than others. Uh, I ask myself that question, because I, you know, am amazed at the amount of money I've been able to make in television. The interesting thing about this job, I've said it for years, I would have done it for free, only I'm not telling them that now. But uh, <laughs> I would have been happy to do it for free and get a part-time job, you know? Well, money expert Susie Orman is here again today, and she says that no one is destined to be poor. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Honestly. There's a part in the Bible that says the poor we will have always. Do y'all know that? So what about that, Susie? <laughs> okay, now Susie says that anybody in this room, and you all are the room too, the room of the world watching, can choose to be rich. Do you believe that? Yes. Have y'all been to her seminar or something? That's what this <laughs> um, She says that it's not about the level of education you have or the family you came from or the opportunities that you have had, according to Susie, in her new book. There's a brand new book out. I saw it all in the window at uh, Borders driving home last night. Um, well, how's that feel, Susie? I have to tell you, I like the picture. You do? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, how often does an author write a book and her picture looks yeah, like who she really is? Yeah, and I noticed really a little is. necklace. I'm thinking, what made you choose that little necklace? Well, you know, I always wear this necklace. I don't know if you noticed nope, that over. never noticed it till I saw this book <laughs> yeah, cover. Yeah, if you ever see me, I always have the same earrings on. Same necklace, same jewelry. I never change. I bought it once, that's it. Notice the watch. We have the same watch. <laughs> bought it once and that's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, so the book is all over the uh, bookstores. I saw it last night driving home. She says it all starts with the courage uh, to think that you can. Mm -hmm. Now, my friend Maya Angelou always says that courage is the most important of the virtues because it is without it, you can't practice any of the others consistently. Courage is what takes you into the action that you need to create that which you want. You know, everybody says to me, Susie, what does courage have to do with being yeah. rich? And I can tell you, if you don't have money to pay the bills, it takes courage to walk to the mailbox, to take those bills out knowing that you don't have money to pay for it. It takes courage yeah. to think that you can own a home if you're not making any money or that you'll ever be able to retire yeah. or that things can change yeah. your thoughts can create tremendous greatness for you, Oprah, but you have to have the courage to think those thoughts. Yeah, and most times you're afraid. You, a lot of people, you know, we've done these shows where uh, I'm sure there's some of you in here who you don't open the bills because you think they'll disappear magically somehow. <laughs> you don't open them. So, <laughs> um, so you're saying that it takes courage because people are afraid of... Yeah, you know, you know so many people think that their financial state, because it's less than, therefore their emotional state is totally in chaos. But I've got news for you, it's totally in reverse. Because your emotional state is in chaos, that is why your fi financial state right. is in chaos. If you have fear, shame, and anger, if you think you can't, you never ever will. All those things translate to no money. So you gotta clear up the, all that shame and anger and fear First and chaos. First the emotions have to go, mm -hmm. and then comes the money. It's not that, I have to tell you, it's not that God just looked down Oprah and said, Oprah's to have more money, you're not. It's not like he or she, whoever it is up there, chose. All of them. Right? Who yeah. is to win life's yeah. financial lottery? It's not like that. It's not that you had more desire than this woman next here. It's how we think and feel about our money are the key factors that determine how much we have and we ultimately get to keep. And it takes courage to look at how you really think and feel okay, about your situation. Okay, because that's Susie's new book. The courage to be rich. Uh, Susie says that she believes that thoughts of poverty uh, kept her own father poor. Take a look. I felt very poor living in a family where disaster often struck. My father worked harder than any man I had known my entire life. 
but his small chicken business always seemed to be on the verge of collapse. You know, my father was always so afraid that there wouldn't be enough money to pay the bills, and this fear manifested in all kinds of ways, such as him running into a burning building to save the cash in his register. That's when I learned that money was more important than life itself, or so I thought. My father never thought that it could be any different for us, because he always used to say, this is just the way things are meant to be, and that's how it is. After my father died, I was so shocked to learn that he had actually gone to law school, but he didn't finish because he gave his tuition money to his father to open up a chicken business. That's when my dad gave up his dream to have more and to be more. So you were saying in every shot, your father's wearing the same pair of pants? Yeah, it's, same shirt. you know, it was so, it was something to go through all these pictures to put this together. and. It didn't matter what time of day, what time of year, what occasion, he had the same pair of pants and the same shirt on. And I have such a memory, because they were always filled with chicken, you know, because he plucked chicken and the chicken blood on him. Mm -hmm. And we went, because we were from Chicago, we went to one of the stores. We went in, and he needed to buy a new shirt, and nobody would wait on him because of how he looked. And I'll never forget him looking at me saying, Susie, just let's go, it's okay. It's that shame. It was that fear that he passed down to me. I myself never thought I could be more or have more. He tried so, he had such courage. He got up every day like many of you to go to work, but he never ever thought that he could be more than that. Do you know he never told any of us that he went to law school? It was a secret from everybody because he never became a lawyer. Shame and fear is what you pass down now, to your children. Now, you say that those people who, because we've done many of these shows with you over the past year, and there's always somebody, and I'm sure there's somebody in this audience who says, we work so hard, we yes. work so hard, we work so hard. And you say that the people who work harder and have less truly don't think that they can have more. Yeah, you know, it's true. You see all these people in the same situation. They work every day. Some have more, some have less. Why? It's not the energy they put out. What's going on? I have found that when you think you can't, you never ever will. Thoughts of poverty are bonds of poverty. You sit up, I know you're listening to me and you're going, oh Susie, it can't be just that simple as thoughts. Yeah, I have that's what to people tell say. you, it is. It is that simple. If you think you can't, you never ever will. I can't say that enough and it takes courage to think great and thoughts. And when you undervalue uh, who you are, the world undervalues what you do. Yes, it's like so many times we, you know, don't even prize ourselves on what we do. We don't think what we do is important in this world, and there is a law of money. It actually goes when you undervalue what you do, the world undervalues who you are. That's why they don't send you the clients you want or the pay raises that you so deserve or the job advances that you so desire. And why did it slip through your hands? Because you yourself are undervaluing who you are, so why should the world value? Susie herself lost everything before she found the courage to be rich, and she's pretty rich now. Uh, <laughs> thanks to a lot of y'all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, she says that her own shame about growing up poor and her fear of never having enough eventually led to her own financial disaster. Take a look. When I was five years old, I had already learned that the reason my parents were unhappy wasn't because they didn't love each other, but was because they didn't have the money to pay their bills. That's when I learned that the key to happiness was money. When I was growing up, I had so much shame, I'm not proud to say this, about who my father was, because he was a chicken plucker. For seven years right after college, I was a waitress at the Buttercup Bakery, and I never even thought that I could be anything more than that. Then all of a sudden one day, I dared to think I could be more. Shortly after that, I became an account executive at Merrill Lynch, went on to become a vice president of investments for Prudential Based Securities, then started my own financial firm. Why? Because I had the courage to think that I could. And then financial disaster struck and I lost everything. But I didn't want people to know, so I continued to spend and spend. And before I knew it, I had maxed out all my credit cards. I was living such a lie, but none of my friends knew. As soon as I decided to view this disaster as a gift and to face the shame and tell everybody the truth about what was happening, my entire life turned around and look at what has happened now. Fear and shame and anger are emotions of poverty.
They are emotions of poverty, and whenever we act from those emotions, we create poverty. You're going to see as the show goes on today that all of us take actions based mainly out of anger, and that anger will destroy any financial foundation quicker than anything that you can build. It can, money can come into you, it will go out. Okay, because lady of anger. in blue over there, are you, you're looking incredulous because you're talking about fear to do anything or to try. But if you know you've got so much money, not, not myself right now, but I'm talking about these young couples, they have these kids and everything else. And if there's only a certain amount of money coming in, you show me where you can get that other money and put it away to okay. do anything. This, that's, I saw your face, and that's why I, I keyed into you. Well, One of the things I think... We... things sound good, yeah. but let's be factual with some of these families. You so... only get a, a paycheck, that's what you live off of. Okay, this is a key here. That's why I, I thought you were going to be a wonderful teaching example for the world today. <laughs> And I'll, we'll talk about that when we come back, because the kind of fear she's talking about isn't just about money. That's what it's, we're talking about, fear, anger, and, and anxiety that goes back through your life. We're not just talking about money. And what happens is it looks like what's going on with the money in your life is what's causing all the fear and anxiety, but it's much deeper than that. That's why I wanted you to stand up, and now we're going to go to commercial break well, and come back and talk fear. to you. So where's all my money? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. We're talking to our favorite money expert, Susie Orman. She has a new book out called The Courage to Be Rich. Lady in Blue, we were talking to you earlier because I understand what you're saying. We do lots of shows like this where people talk, where they think that fear is being afraid of a particular thing. Let me just use myself as an example. I spent most of my life being afraid. I had all the trappings of, you know, being a wealthy person, successful person, but still was afraid afraid of confrontation, afraid of people, what people might think of me, afraid of not doing well, afraid of not being enough, afraid of not being worthy. All of those things which, in one way or another, keep you from being the person that you were meant to be. You see what I'm saying? No, so it's not that. like I'm afraid the boogeyman's gonna come in or I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to pay my bills. It's, it's an internal emotional fear that affects the way you move through your life. Just remember the name of this book is The Courage to Be Rich. Rich doesn't mean just money. having money. Right. It means internally, it means externally, it means materially and spiritually. There are plenty of people with loads of money and they are anything but rich. Oh. See what I'm saying? It's a wonderful line Neil Donald Walsh uses, I think, in um, the uh, Conversations with God 3, where he says, as long as, though, this is was spring for me, uh, as long as you are, uh, your definition of yourself is determined by anything outside of yourself, mm -hmm. by what other people say or think of you, you are still a slave to those people yeah. and those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And you are not free until you can live absolutely from the center of yourself. Whatever they say, whatever they think, whatever. That's my issue. Yours might be something else, you know. But that's what I mean by, it's not about, oh, I'm afraid. Because when you, we do these shows, we did a show with Yana, we were talking to the men about their fears. And every single man said, I ain't scared of nothing. I ain't scared of nobody. I ain't afraid. I ain't afraid. Afraid of love? What does that mean? Afraid of love. <laughs> you know I need more love. That's what I need. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, my one, I don't mean to go interrupt ahead, yeah. you. Ah, there we go. Interrupt, Oprah, it's fine. But no, but my greatest desire in life was always to know my own thoughts. How many of us really know our own thoughts and what we think? I know what everybody thought of me. I know what I wanted everybody to think because, of me. Yeah. But I didn't know my own thoughts. Rich thoughts of your own self right. create a tremendously rich life. Yeah. However, I would be the last person in this world to say money alone will ever make you happy. But I will tell you this, I'd be the first to say lack of money sure can make you miserable. So you can have inner wealth, you can have outer wealth, you can have it all if you just have the courage to look within yourselves to find out what has to be done and conquer that. Yeah, your book is really, uh, it's financial, but it's more spiritual, as are all of them. But it's more spiritual than anything. It, it truly combines it all. You know, so many people think, oh, well, money is money. So many financial experts said to me, Susie, 
What does feelings have to do with money? Money is just money. I know, I hear see people attacking you about that. They do, it takes courage, I have to tell you, to become successful, because once you do, everybody tries to bring you down, especially yeah. the male financial advisors. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's true. I've noticed that happening to you, yes. Yes, I know, but sit across the desk from a woman who just lost her husband due to di divorce or death, and you tell me money doesn't have to do with feelings. Start over all by yourself when you don't know where to look or what to do. Tell me money doesn't have to do with feelings. Money is a significant part of your life, who you are and how you deal with it. A lot has to do with, with yeah, feelings. Yeah, and identifying who you are and what your fears are and being able to truly release yourself from that is the road to and the courage to be rich. Do you not think? I do because, again, please believe me, we all have internal obstacles that keep us from having more and being more. Those internal obstacles are fear, shame, and anger. The external obstacle that keeps us from having more and being more is clutter. We've already seen shows on clutter, right? But if you have a closet that has a dress in it that still has a price tag or a suit that you've never worn, I'm telling you, if you don't have the money in your life that you want, clutter and your internal obstacles are standing smack in the middle of what you could have and what you should have. With 50% of all marriages ending in divorce, 50, and money being the number one reason why couples split, Susie says that couples who want to be truly rich must be financially intimate. Tell us what that means. Financially intimate means as being as intimate about your money as you are in every other aspect of your life. Isn't it true when you get to know somebody, you know everything about them? They leave the toilet seat up. They leave their dirty underwear by the side of the bed. I'm serious here. You know everything if they snore, if they don't snore, everything about them. What do you know about their money? Nothing. And if you think when it comes to money, love is going to conquer all, <laughs> I've got news for you. You are wrong. It's time. If you're going to merge souls, your, your love souls, you have to merge your financial souls as well. You have to become financially intimate and do what I call practicing safe money. <laughs> this is Monica and Avery. He manages a restaurant and she is a pre-med student. And like many of you, serious money problems have uh, threatened their marriage. Susie thinks shame, fear, and anger are making them poor. And I know that to those of you who are just listening, just like the lady in blue over there, it sounds, sounds like... Okay, those are nice words or words used to describe the situation, but that's why she goes into really great detail about it in the book. And if you read it and you're moved by it, that's really wonderful. If you're not, we're not talking to you. A few days ago, uh, Monica and Avery told us how difficult it has been for them. Take a look. You get the impression that we're the perfect little family. We never have arguments. Everything is nice and in order, and uh, it's a lie. We have had our lights cut off. We've had um, car repossessions, eviction notices. Our financial problems are so bad, they're ruining our marriage. We've even separated for a while. We're $29,000 in debt. Initially, we accumulated our debt through purchases, like going out to eat, short getaways, vacations. Clothes. I blame Avery for a lot of the debt because of um, bad investments, um, paying the bills late, um, charging items on the credit cards that he did not need. I'm, I'm not the only spender. I mean, my wife spends, you know, as well. I was ashamed when our car was repossessed, when we had to drive an older model car. I know it's my fault. I know we shouldn't be in this situation. I don't know how to get out. He's supposed to be the head of the household, and he's not providing for us. The financial burden has also caused problems in the bedroom. I've slept on the couch for maybe even a month. More than anything, this, this debt, this strain, this lack of finance has, has taken my partner, has taken my friend, my wife. I need my partner to be able to talk things over and communicate with. I know my wife loves me, but there's so much debt that is blocking that love from flowing. How much time did you spend with them? 
We spent probably six hours together. Okay. And uh, let me just tell you this, because this doesn't happen in an hour on television. That's why I mentioned that. Um, during that session with Susie, I understand that you realize, this is what my little note says, that your anger and his shame were keeping you poor. Yes. Um, it was keeping me in bondage um, from the wealth of information that Susie told us, mm -hmm. gave us. That's what was hindering us from moving on financially. Okay. Because, Avery, you were ashamed uh, and are ashamed or were ashamed of your financial situation. Right, definitely. Right. definitely. Which then keeps you from? Um, I mean, the, the shame and the fear, as, as Susie said, it, I mean, my wife used this term of it, it holds you in bondage. Um, there's, there's so much that, that you want to do, but fear of, well, what if it doesn't work? Yet another failure. I mean, I know I felt so much of so many times I would see an opportunity and I think in the back of my mind, this is it, this is the way out. Mm -hmm. But yet I'd failed so many times before that uh, possibly I could have passed up the right opportunity because I was afraid of failing, letting my wife down again. You know. Yeah, and most important, you realized during that session that you were passing your anger and your shame onto your children. We didn't initially, but uh, after, after our session, we realized how much more of the shame and anger was being passed on than the feelings that we thought. And just out of curiosity, so you hear the lady in blue, don't you like to know for the rest of your life you are now known as the lady in blue, but that, <laughs> that you hear her say, what is fear, what does anger have to do with how much money you don't have? Do you understand why it does? Yes. You now do? Yes. Yeah. 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 You have to go through it. You have to see it to get it. So he, he, one of my notes says you put things before money. What does that mean? Well, basically, it's, there's this law of money, people first, then money, then things. What Avery and Monica realized, most of us value things more than we value money. That's why we have more things in our house than money in our bank accounts. If you don't have money to buy the things, you just can't do oh, it. Oh, boy, they got a big old amen over here. <laughs> oh, they haven't read the book, but they got that part. God! Because they're saying, I have more things than I have money. <laughs> bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Coming up, Susie shows Monica and Avery how forgiveness, I know that's also a difficult concept, can give them the courage to be rich. The courage to be rich when we come back. Susie uh, showed Monica and Avery how forgiveness, and I know this, this is a difficult concept for a lot of you, can get them past the anger and shame that's keeping them from the money that they want. Take a look. In order to be rich, the two of you have to be financially intimate. Avery, I need you to tell Monica what you want, what you need to make this work for you. I need you to release me from seven years of mistakes, seven years of bad decision making. I can't do it with the weight of the bills, the weight of the lack of money, and the weight of your anger and resentment. I can't. So Monica, can you take down those walls of resentment and anger and tell Avery what you need from him? I need us to work together. I need for you to not spend when I don't agree with the things that you want to buy or want to invest in. I want the two of you to take new vows to make a new commitment in regards to money. I promise you I will never make another financial decision that will affect our lives without first consulting you first. I promise. And how do you feel when Avery says that? I believe that you truly mean what you say, and I want to see you keep your word. For him to be able to keep it, he needs your forgiveness. He needs your encouragement. I'm sorry for all the, the pain that I've caused you. I truly love you, and I'll do all that I can to knock those walls down and start all over. How did that feel? Like freedom. So I hear a lot's changed since these sessions, is that correct? You yes. can tell me. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I already know, but the world doesn't, so. 
Definitely so. Um, okay. I mean, yesterday was a really good example. Um, we had a chance just to be out in, in Chicago about town. And um, it was just amazing that every, every thought about little things, you know, little purchases, we wanted to buy um, you know, a little small outfit for, for my son. And uh, I, I just asked my wife, I said, you know, is this something that, that he needs or something that, that we want to get? And it was for the first time. That shocked me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it felt really weird, honestly, to ask that question because I think for a lot of men, it, um, well, I know for me, I'll speak for myself, it um, seemed to be like breaking out of a, a bondage that men have about asking permission. There, there's a stigma that to be a man, you know, you can never ask, you just step out and do. Mm -hmm. And my wife is just forced to follow and just say, okay, you're the man, I'll just, you know, tag along. But it was, it was, um, I guess, a breakthrough because after I was able to ask, I felt that she appreciated me asking and not it made only, me want to do it more. Not only that, um, the closeness that we have for each other um, now I'm able to enjoy him. This was Friday, um, Monica. We met. This is just a few days ago. Now, how do you feel about each other? Excuse me, is this I, a Tuesday? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, no, this just a few <laughs> days ago. Mm -hmm. Has your life changed with each other in just a few days? Yes, it has. And, and I give um, just all praises to God because I know that we could not have done it without God and also you, Susie, oh. that it's just opened God, my Susie. heart to be able to forgive him because I kept myself in bondage for so long. And then looking back, if my husband can forgive me some of the choices that I made, the decisions that I made that caused us to have problems in our relationship, I should be able to forgive him. And in every aspect, it has changed for the better. <laughs> I will not be saying what those are. <laughs> But I, I will. They're now enjoying intimacy on all levels. <laughs> <laughs> Susie says, um, <laughs> Susie says there, there, there's one vital question to ask yourself each time you speak about your money. What is that? Yeah, you know, isn't it true? I know we've heard about fear and the anger, but what are your thoughts? Say, so, you know, it's so important if you're going to create more, your words, your thoughts and your actions have to be one. So how many of you have ever said, I'm never gonna have enough money, I'm never gonna get out of credit card debt, I'm never gonna be able to send my children to school, I'm never going to be able to retire, I am never going to be able to afford a home. How many of you, raise your hands, have you ever thought that, said it out loud? It is very important that you all understand your words are extremely powerful. They have the power to create or the power to destroy and the choice is up to you. So from now on, I want you to learn how to speak the language of wealth, not the language of poverty. I can't. Poor Susie, I never, are all words of poverty. I want you to ask yourself this one question when you have a thought in regards to your money. If you say, I'm never going to get out of debt, I want you to stop and ask yourself this one question. Do you want this to be true? Do you want to always be in credit card debt? The answer is no. You have to rephrase that, and you need to s rephrase it that I'm going to be out of debt soon. Think positive thoughts, say positive words, learn how to speak the language of wealth. Use that question, and it will help you get through it. Coming up, an overspender who hides purchases from her husband. There are a lot of you out there. <laughs> this is your segment coming up. Discovers that her anger could lead to bankruptcy. Her anger, could this be you? Find out next. Okay, The Courage to be Rich with Susie Orman today. Um, we're talking about financial intimacy, and this is Jennifer. She says she's never been financially intimate with her husband because she's been overspending and hiding debt from him throughout their marriage. And I know there are a lot of you all who are watching. Come a little closer to the TV right now. <laughs> this is yours and Jennifer's story. Take a look. I am a compulsive shopper. Even though I have a great job, I have charged over $40,000 on my credit cards in the last couple of years and have hidden most from my husband. But when I get home and he sees all the packages, I feel guilty because he makes me feel guilty about it. The spending has definitely taken a toll on our marriage. We were separated for a short time due to it, and it's a major problem. I'm sick of living a lie about my credit card debt. 
couple months ago, I cut up all my credit cards. As I sat there sobbing about plastic, told my husband everything I had bought. He gave me one credit card for an emergency, and now it's maxed out, and I really want to get help. So when Jennifer met with Susie, she was surprised to find out that anger uh, was causing her credit card debt. Take a look. We have 50000 not 40000 now, $50,000 of credit card debt right here. When I'm most upset, I go into a store and I shop. And what is it that you're upset about? Just anything. Alex went out and bought a brand new car. I was pissed off that he went out and bought himself a new car and I was driving around in a seven-year-old car. I went to a dealership, bought a car in two hours. So you're buying all these things. Mm -hmm. Why? I'm yearning for something that's just not there. I know that. I really think it has to do with my mom. I lost my mom when I was 25, yes. and we were very close. Me and her love to shop together, and when I'm shopping, I feel like she's with me. How angry are you at your mother for having died? Very angry. I'm very angry that she died. She left me here alone. You're angry at your mother for having left you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You're Absolutely. angry that Alex went out and bought a car you're angry, angry, angry. And that anger emerges how? By spending things. By spending. When you build a financial foundation based on anger, mm -hmm. it will crumble. The way that you get rid of anger is to forgive. Forgive your past so that you can live in the present. Do you know that you are this close to bankruptcy? I don't think about it. When you owe as much as you make, you are utterly bankrupt. It's a scary thought. This is hate. This is hate of who you are, hate of what you have. Why do you hate yourself so much that you are destroying who you are by what you're spending? What are you afraid of? I'm afraid that, that I will be alone, and I don't want to be alone. Boy, that is, this is great work because it's getting to the root of what the real problems are. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, would you have thought that, really? If you'd just been watching Susie on this show and she'd well, said the I same thing? Well, I had seen the show in January, uh -huh. and I taped it. It's uh -huh. the only Oprah show I've ever taped. Well, God bless and... you. <laughs> I watch it every day. No, I taped it 14 so 14 that... years, that's all you can do? Because okay. I watch it every day. Okay, it's the only you. one I tape for my husband to okay. watch. And we sat down and we watched it and we cut up all the credit cards, but it didn't do anything. And I wrote a letter because I wanted to get out of debt. I met with her, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. Over the weekend, we did not have one fight. We talked about everything, everything we were going to purchase over the weekend, and we did great. I returned $1,000 worth of stuff after I left Susie. And I felt so good. Mm -hmm. I felt amazing. Mm -hmm. And my husband didn't want to come today because he didn't want to deal with this. Yeah. But um, he said, I've been telling you this all along. And I said, I needed someone else to tell me what I needed to do. And something about what she said to me hit home. And we're going to do it. We're going to get out of debt and I have no credit cards, none, done. All right, coming up, you ever worry about losing everything? Next, how this woman found the courage to be rich after a devastating divorce. We'll show you about this next. And you're smiling today, oh my God, that's great. Well, Susie says at some point, every one of us will face starting over after divorce or death or financial crisis. This is Linda Lindsay, and we met her last year on a show we did about corporate wives. Just a few months after that show, uh, she received some devastating news from the husband that she had adored. Do you all remember this story? Does she yeah. look familiar <laughs> to you? OK, take a look at this, will you? Oprah, since the last time Ron and I were on your show, something unbelievable has happened in our lives. My husband has filed for divorce for me. Our toast on Mother's Day was that we would be together forever. I also received a beautiful card from Ron saying to my beautiful wife, just another chance to tell you how much I love you. 
three days later, I received the summons for divorce. I read the first line and I collapsed, crying hysterically. I was devastated. The farthest thing from my mind that my husband, who seemed to love me so much, would apply for a divorce. I've devoted most of my time to working for my husband. I have 30 days to vacate our home. I have to remove everything I own from this house. I don't know where I'm going to be putting it. I don't really know what I've done wrong, but that I do love him still. When was that, Linda, that we taped that? That was in um, June, the second show. The right second after show. He had left me in May. I know. I was when I saw that tape, I was devastated for you. I'm no longer devastated. Well, I won't be either. <laughs> Linda says, listen to this. She was so in love with Ron that she gave up her financial power when they married, but she got it back after the divorce. What did you do? I uh, did so many things that Susie recommends in her book. I put a lot of the shame of that failure behind me. I put the anger of the manner in which Ron left me. I put that quickly behind me. Uh, through a good friend and neighbor, I mustered up the courage to start my life over. I must tell you, I, I enrolled in a real estate school. My first sale was over a million dollars. And I have been extremely successful ever since. And I believe in the courage that I believe in myself that I can do it. Yeah. I have no fears now of uh, not having a man to keep me and support me. I can do it all on my own because I believe in myself. Amazing, Grace. <laughs> Amazing, Grace. I know. I don't have time to say this. Okay. I was just going to say that in that tape, you know, first of all, your eyes were all puffy, like you've been crying for days. I'm sure I you, was. I'm sure you had. <laughs> uh, so I, I was amazed that you would let us come in at that time. But you were saying there was something so sad and timid about the way you said, I don't know what I did wrong. I still don't know what I did long. There, we had no uh, financial intimacy in our marriage. I wasn't on any of the banking accounts. I wasn't on any savings account. We purchased a home. I wasn't a part of that deed. And it showed to me that although we didn't have financial intimacy, we never had emotional intimacy either. And I think, like Susie says, you need the two to make everything work and live in harmony. And we lack that extremely in our marriage. Okay, coming up after her painful divorce, Linda not only started over financially, she also found a rich way to recapture her spirit, because that's where it all starts. We'll show you how next. So as we heard earlier, Linda Lindsay's marriage and divorce was an emotional roller coaster. She transformed herself into the perfect company wife. But when it was over, she learned to heal her broken spirit by refocusing on her children, her friends, her life. Take a look. As I was getting over this divorce, my daughter Lori wrote this poem for me. Cherubs make her smile. She never could cook. <laughs> But she taught me to make lemonade from lemons. She walks away with dignity, believes in charity and integrity. Whatever she takes up, she improves. All are far better from her touch, for she is beauty and she is grace, and you will always find these things in her place. I love you, Mom. Lori. I wanted to set an example for my children, an example of how to overcome a hardship and to handle it with dignity and with grace. They built this house to protect that tree. So. I wanted them to see that it wasn't anger that I was dwelling on. I think I'm a very, very wealthy person, and it has nothing to do with the money. The love of my children is, is probably uh, the biggest richness I have. The love and support of my friends is wealth that's immeasurable to me. I am working hard to reciprocate that love and support that they have all shown me throughout this time. Those are the riches that I feel I have today. This divorce 
has put me in touch with my spirituality and has had me touch my spirit in such a way that I now feel that my life is so important. It's made me be a better person. It's made me be a more giving person. It's made me a more forgiving person. Susie says in her book, uh, this is your favorite quote, page 149. Yes. <laughs> your marriage failed. This is for everybody who's going through divorce now. And now it is your responsibility to conclude it as successfully as possible. How you end something as profound and important as a marriage is a reflection of how you live your life, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. We'll be right back. We're out of time. Thank you, everybody. The Courage to be Rich, Susie Orman's book, available in bookstores as of right now. Thank you again, Susie. Thank you. Thank you, David.